So we are coming to the closing keynote of the day, which will really round things out. We're going to hear uh, that one more talk, and then we're going to close the day's content and then move into our evening event, Open in Sparwell, which I'll tell you about afterward. Um, but right now, uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome Chris Kelly to the stage. Good evening. So uh, it's been a long day, and I really appreciate you guys giving your attention. I know how much a you know eight or nine hour day can be when you're sitting in sessions and talking. Um, something I found very compelling about this conference is actually uh, normally when I go to an open source conference, I mostly talk about software almost exclusively. Um, and this conference has been so much more than that, and that's been really interesting to me, um, sort of a new thing for me. And I actually think it works really well because the talk I'm about to give. Um, starts from software but moves into the cultural ramifications of open source and what that means. And so I really think this conference is um, kind of something unique and something special. I've been to conferences all over the world and this one's um, quite different. Um, so thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me and thank you for listening for a few minutes. Um, as you heard, my name is Chris Kelly. I work at GitHub. Uh, I work in the outreach team, so that means I mostly spend my time uh, communicating with our, our, with our community, um, working on how to amplify their work and really sort of celebrating the things that they do. Um, I've got a lot of um, awesome opportunity to do that, and so I really appreciate that, and I wanna thank GitHub for sending me um, around the world to do that kind of stuff. Today I wanna to talk about open source, but really I wanna talk about it from a cultural perspective. What does it mean when we talk about open source, and broadly speaking, outside of the world of software? To do that, let's start back in 1968. 1968, Computer science was actually computer science. I think you know, sometime in the 90s, we kind of stopped doing computer science um, and doing some actual interesting things. Um, and, but in the 60s and the 70s, this is where like, major innovation was happening in the, in the world of computer science. Um, and most of us probably in this room haven't been born yet. I wasn't. Um, and I really believe that it's important that we read the literature back from an era where we weren't born, when the, this kind of work was being done. Um, and there's a really interesting paper that came out in 1968 um, in a journal called Datamation. This influential paper was uh, written by Melvin Conway, and it's How Do Committees Invent? What it was really about was, what he was talking about specifically, was that uh, software project management was sort of a, an emerging field, and he was trying to figure out how do we um, decide what to build and what do we work on. But in the end, 33 years later, he actually was quoted that this became far more influential than he had ever anticipated when he wrote this. It's a 3,500 word paper, and I think you should read the entire thing. Um, but the most important part comes about 3,000 words in. And we're gonna jump to the bottom. It's two paragraphs from the back. That's where his thesis ends up being. Um, and that thesis is what really kind of is this linchpin on the cultural ramifications of open source and the way we build groups. So Conway, he says, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. It's a lot to unpack, right? It's a, it's a lot of words. But what he's talking about is that communication systems define the way our products are built, our companies are built, our societies are built, our organizations are built. The way we talk defines the way things are built. That's what his general thesis is. This is known as Conway's Law. And you might have heard of that, you might hear it be brought up. I think it's one of the most influential thought pieces in computer science. Um, and so I definitely recommend reading the entire piece, but this is what's important to pay attention to. So Conway's Law is about communication and systems. Anthropologists and linguists have been studying this phenomenon for quite some time. Quite a bit of work has been established um, that our language actually impacts the way that we think, the way that we understand the world. There are tribes that have no notion of relative position. There's no left, right, up, or down. There's only north, south, east, and west. That actually changes the way they see the world and the way they understand their world, the way they describe it, the way they think about it. There's I, my left leg is not a thing. My southeast leg is. That's an actual phenomenon. So if we want to design systems broadly conceived, and we're talking not just software, we're talking about systems in general, societies, organizations, um, teams, what do we need to know about communication and how to define that? What makes up communication? So tools define communication. Does your company use email? Chat rooms? Do they have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings? What about instant messenger? How do, these, how do these tools impact the way you communicate? If you're using 
um, chat rooms. Everything I say is seeable by everybody else in that chat room. I, th I say things differently when I'm in that context. If I'm doing something on instant messenger, it's a silo. That information is now trapped between me and that other person. That can't be shared out just as easily. Those things change the way we communicate. So tools are important to think about when we're defining the way we communicate. Processes are another thing that defines communication. Do you have to get approval to get work done? Do you, need a, do you have the authority at your company to make decisions? Do you need to talk to a manager who then talks to another manager, then talks to some other person who gets you information and that information follows all the way back to you? Anyone related to this? Like, have you felt this? How does that process change the way we communicate? Obviously, there's impedance there. It changes the way we are structured, the way we think about ourselves. How does that make you think about the work you do, the value of your work, the things that, you are, that are important to you? Knowing the tools and the processes that impact our communication, we need to be very intentional about them. Communication is an emergent phenomenon. Humans just, it emerged out of the way we, we work together. It comes natural to us. But we forget that we don't all communicate the same. There's distance, time zones, cultures. All of these things impact the way we can communicate. I have a distributed team. I have people that uh, are currently working in Asia, and I have people that are working in, in Europe. There's not a single time, time during the day that I can have my entire team on a phone call and we can catch base. There's not a, a logical time that that can happen, that somebody's not up at midnight to do this. I can't communicate my, my team within a face-to-face -face system. I have to use other modes. And communication is hard, and so we need to be very intentional about it. We need to craft how we communicate and understand that's how, we, how it impacts the way we work, how productive we are, and what we produce. Open source is often held as this like panacea for how we can solve this communication problem. Why don't we just all work like open source? I've heard that a lot today, right? You know, it's, we're talking about open source impacting all kinds of fields, economics to software. So what are the promises of open source? There's really no canonical principles. We talked about four of them this morning, right? We talked about transparency, participation, collaboration, freedom of innovation. I call that one creativity. These are the things we're searching when we're looking for designing a communication system. When we're trying to adopt open source principles, these are the sort of baseline that we want. We want these in our system. And there's good reason for that. There's lots of great benefits that come out of um, the notions of open source. Open source means that you're accountable. Everything you do means everyone else can see it. If I make a decision, you can see the chain in how I made that decision. I have to explain myself. I have to show my, my thought, my work. We can see who's responsible for it. That's a great thing. Openness is about accountability. You also have to take the time to explain. I have to slow down. If I'm explaining something to somebody in chat, I need to add a bunch of context so they understand. The high fidelity of face-to-face -face communication um, allows me to transfer a lot of information very quickly. But when I'm having to do it in chat or an email or any number of other um, text mediums, I have to slow down and I have to explain myself. I have to explain my thinking. That's a really good thing. Open also means anyone can participate, right? It's open. There aren't hierarchies of people for participating. There's not approval processes. Open means you can participate. You want to contribute, you contribute. There aren't supposed to be barriers for participation in openness, which means open provides more diversity. Since everyone can participate, it means that contributions and collaborations come from a wide range of people. We get a nice diverse set, but is this actually true? These are the things that we talk about in ideals, but do they actually hold? Jessica talked about it earlier today. Um, if, this is a, if this slide is 100% representation of all the software developers, that yellow circle are the number of women developers in software, 12.6%. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use statistics. Uh, Jessica was, was shy about them. The, these are, every paper you read will have a slightly different variation. The ones I read say 12.6% are women. That's one in 12. That's not very many. One in, one in 12 again, so 1.5%, are open source developers. That's a sh fraction of the number of software developers that are women participating in software, in open source software. That's shocking. That's shocking to me. If your face doesn't look like this when you hear those statistics, I don't know. This is, what, this is how I feel when I think about open source and getting more participation. And there's a lot of different facets. I'm not saying gender is the only facet of diversity. This is an example of one. 
There's race, there's nationality, there's language, there's age, there's background, lots of other diversity. I'm not saying gender is the only one. This one we have the most statistics on, so it's the easiest to use as an example. So these are all ideals, and obviously our ideals aren't quite perfect. We don't have great diversity. We don't have great communication. What are the realities of open source? In the real world, ideals rarely hold up. And let me tell you about some of the things I've seen in the real world. Open source means anyone can participate. That's right, this is also a negative. Um, Donnie Burkholz, an analyst from Red Monk, has a, an awesome talk called Assholes Are Ruining Your Project. He gave that in, in FOSDEM in 2013. Because anyone can participate, that means assholes can participate. And assholes are the, usually the loudest participants. Um, Brandon Keepers, who gave a talk this morning, has also identified that the very notion of software development, what we see in open source communities, is that most software developers in those communities are uh, white men who have a very thick skin. Uh, and by white men, I mean privilege, um, as Jessica mentioned as well, as well. And by the way, Jessica and I did not coordinate on these talks. Um, this white man privilege with thick skin is, a, you know, is homogenous. Homogeny is the antithesis of diversity. It's, we simply can't have it. So by the way we communicate in, in open source, it creates this homogeny. Open is a bazaar and not a cathedral. You're probably familiar with Eric Raymond's um, book, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Hopefully you are if you're interested in open source. You should read it if you have not. It's from 1999. He identifies open source as this bazaar. You're familiar with bazaars in um, various countries. They're loud, full of traders, they're negotiating, it's chaotic, it's a marketplace. Now, there's a lot of benefits to those notions, but what happens in those marketplaces? Have you ever gone to um, Marrakesh and gone through one of the bazaars and tried to negotiate? If you are not a loud, confident, sort of aggressive person, you're going to pay more for the things you're buying than the person that is loud and aggressive. It's just the nature of it. So are bazaars necessarily the things that we want? Or are cathedrals, things that are structured and designed and long-lived, long are those are the things that we want? Open can lead to an argument culture. If you've ever read a uh, comment on Hacker News or you've been on Reddit or basically any kind of thread on YouTube, you've seen argument culture. This is the sad reality of open source. It's, it's definitely not what we want, but it is the truth. Argument culture is the primary thing hurting diversity um, in our industry right now. And my thought has been significantly impacted by um, a book called The Argument Culture by Deborah Tannen. And also, if you want to get introduced to this concept, um, Kate Heddleston has a great blog post entitled Argument Cultures and the Unregulated Aggression. So arguments aren't about dominance. They're about dominance, not ideas. You think arguments are about ideas. We think in an ideal world that we have this sense of intellectual Darwinism where we cut down the weak ideas and the, the best ideas flourish. Well, that's great in an ideal world, but arguments aren't about that. Arguments are about dominance and power. Sociologists have identified this phenomenon as the argument, argumentative theory of reasoning. Massive studies have been done to show that argumentation is actually has very little to do with logic and fact and has very much to do with emotion. What we're concerned about in arguments is winning. We get emotionally invested in our ideas and we want them to win, no matter how true the irrefutable evidence comes. What we want is to win, no matter how true the facts are. And the desire to win is an emotional response that seems to be hardwired into our thinking. Sociologists have studied this over and over and over again. Arguments are never about logic. Arguments are about emotion. In Think Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman documents countless studies that show how people are not rational or objective in their thinking. Their decision making is driven by emotion and emotion alone. He shows that people are emotional beings when they make these decisions. This is a problem, this problem is because arguments have a dramatic effect on the quality of work and productivity that our groups are. Arguments are detrimental to the work we do. Arguments impede creativity. Great creative companies like Pixar and IDEO have studied this and understand they've taken out argumentation in their ideation phases that you are not allowed to say negative things in brainstorming phases. They've understood this, and they are some of the most creative organizations in the world. Arguments impede diversity. Arguments mean the loudest or the most aggressive people win. Like in open source communities, this creates a homogeny. All the loud people are the ones that win, 
and they were ones that stay. And now we've got this group of very like-minded, similar people all hanging around together. Studies in biodiversity refute the fact that um, homogeny is actually beneficial. Diversity is the thing that is strengthens an environment. Um, coral reefs are a great example that biodiversity is hugely dependent um, on their survival. And once homogeny sets in, there's a high risk of collapse. So we don't want homogeny in our systems. We want diversity. Arguments are actually particularly disadvantageous to women. Because an aggressive woman is often perceived as pushy or bossy. We, by very nature, uh, the way our culture is designed, we call that. And I don't, that's, it shouldn't be that way. Simply recognizing arguments as emotional means that we're pigeonholing women into a negative component. So just the very nature of an argumentation culture where emotions are the drivers and not the facts and the logic make women at a, women at a disadvantage. So let's apply Conway's law to this reality. Your communication structure will be your culture. What does your communication structure look like when you have an argumentation culture? Do you have a culture that's creative, diverse, flourishing? Or do you have something else? Simply accepting the notion that open source principles are the solution to anything without consideration means you get the good with the bad. You do get the openness and the accountability, but you also get the, the, the natural evolution towards argument culture. Open is hard. It takes a lot more work than being closed. It's a lot easier to have a face-to-face -face meeting and, and get a, a solution solved and an answer resolved than it is to put it online and wait for an answer, wait for the things you need. It's easy to abandon openness when things get busy or things get hard. Open is a culture. Culture can be crafted. We saw that. We know that we can be intentional about the way we do things. Culture is a network of systems. It's not a list of beliefs. It's about having the right people, the right values, the right tools, and the right processes. Maybe open needs to be more like the cathedral than we give it credit. Maybe the bazaar isn't what we actually want. Open requires collaboration. You need a place that you can work together, not in the silos where a, a single engineer or a single person solves this problem and sends it up the ladder and calls it a day. You need genuine collaboration, where ideas get started early, they're accepted at their face value, and that they give the space to flourish. That's at GitHub, we do pull requests very early so that we can start talking about these things very early, not before the idea is finished, not when it's all cinched up and we found all the answers, but was we know we need to collaborate. Open is about community. It's not a free-for-all. This isn't just some marketplace of ideas. This is actually something that we need to think about and work on. Open needs people that care deeply and want to make it work. Open requires communication. We need healthy communication, not the argument culture. It needs the ability to stop arguments, and when they do happen, how to resolve them, because they are gonna happen. So make sure when you're de designing your systems that you actually do put in place mechanisms to solve these problems. Open requires being intentional. What happens when you remove the argument culture? What does your communication change? Instead of saying no to everything, what if you approach communication with a disposition of yes? How can systems, cultures, and society be changed with open? Thank you.